Now, there were two young preachers that Paul had the privilege of leading to the Lord. And these two young preachers, Paul calls both of them his sons, his genuine sons, that is, spiritual sons, for he led both of them to a saving knowledge of Christ. Now, we have letters to both of these brethren. We have two epistles to Timothy, and we have one epistle here to And yet today, I suppose there's a library full of books that are telling you how to run the local church. And I think when we boil it all down and get these three epistles before us, why, we'll find that the modus operandi is given to us here. And if there is a lack and a need, that it doesn't have to do with organization or It doesn't have to do with some system that's being put in, but rather probably a great spiritual need that is in the church. Now, I want to say just a word or two about these two young preachers again. We've talked about Timothy before, but here we have Titus. Now, Titus, I would say from what we know, and we know very frankly very little about either one of these young preachers, he seems to have been a stronger man, both physically and spiritually. But Timothy, Paul expresses less concern for Titus's welfare. Titus was probably more mature, and he possessed a rather virile personality. And a Jew who was circumcised by Paul, but Titus, who was a Gentile, And Paul seems to have refused to circumcise him. You remember over in Galatians, Paul tells about taking Titus with him to him and sends him.
Mm. I would say that today it's very difficult to find a church that has these three prongs, that is, these three tremendous emphases. Some emphasize one thing and then another. The church should be an orderly church, first of all. Everything Paul said to the Corinthians should be done decently and in order. Well, first of all, the church is to be orderly. Now, sometimes you don't find very much order in the church. And I mean by that. I hear this constantly. I go about over this country, and I've been in many, many churches since I've retired. I've enjoyed it. I've been in some wonderful churches. I didn't know there were so many wonderful churches in this country. And I want to say this in some very wonderful pastors. But I've been in some churches where there's a real heartbreak of the pastor. I generally get his story. Maybe it's lopsided, but I get his story. He has a deacon that's trying to run things. Churches, in I tell you, it's in trouble when there's a deacon or two or an officer or two that want to run things and do not recognize that the church is to be an orderly church, not run by a couple of deacons. Now, I've also been in a church that has not been sound in doctrine. The emphasis was not there at all. And I've seen many churches that have been changed like that. I've talked to several young preachers. I've been in their churches, and one man greatly discouraged by what was happening. And I told him, I said, you know, you and I are not building really churches. And don't try to build an empire. Just teach and give out the Word of God, and you'll find out instead of building up an organization, that is, a lot of buildings, that you're building into the lives of men and women. And that's lots more important, to build into these lives of men and women. We all live in a tent down here. These bodies of ours are tent. I said, build into those. That's the important thing, to keep that before us. Because I said, you may leave your church. You may have built up a big organization and a wonderful church. Then somebody comes along and wrecks it. Well, it will be a heartbreak to you to see that happen, provided that you did not have before you all the time you were building in the lives of men and women. That's important today. And that's the emphasis there. Then he says here in chapter 3 that a church should be ready for every good work. Now, sometimes those of us that are fundamentalists, we put such an emphasis on doctrine, and I don't think we overly emphasize, but we do underemphasize good works. Now, I think a church should be engaged in good works. It seems to me today that there are so many Christian organizations, and that may include our own, that we're concerned about getting in finances to carry on our program, and we're so interested in that that we get interested in people to give instead of us helping people. And there are a lot of folk today that need help. And I do not mean just spiritually, because I think many of us do that to a certain extent. But what about physical needs? What about that type of thing today? Helping people physically and doing things like that. I could mention many, many churches today where they are carrying on a work of helping people. I know one church where they have a group that goes out, one of the visiting pastors, And they have a group that go out, they visit the shut-ins, sit down and read to them, and women go and sew for them. It's a lovely thing to do. I guess it's wonderful to have a government today that's taking care of the poor and needy. Well, we don't have people to just go in and sit down and talk to these folk. And that is a ministry, I think, today that's needed. Now you can see I've given a resume of this epistle here. And it's very important. And I would say liberalism is attempted to emphasize the third chapter, but they ought to remember that there are two chapters that come ahead of that, and that doctrine is important. And until a church has all three of these, it has no claim to be called certainly a New Testament church at all. 
Now let's get underway. And first of all, chapter 1 now, and the subject here, the church is an organization. The first four verses we have here are introduction. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. Now, this is a very wonderful verse here, and it's characteristic of these epistles that we call the pastoral epistle. But it's not characteristic of the other epistles of Paul. Here, he emphasizes he's a servant. And as we've said before, in the other epistles, he's defending his apostleship. Now, here, he's a bond slave, for that is the word here for servant. He's a bond slave of God, and he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. And the reason that he asserts his apostleship here, he's going to give instructions for the organized church. And this comes from an apostle, the appointed writer of the Lord Jesus, the one who now, through his apostles, has communicated with the church. And this is a communication now from the Lord Jesus to us. And it's according to the faith of God's elect. Now, this is a very interesting statement. I would say that it means, actually, not for the faith, but according to the faith. In other words, the norm or standard of faith which is set for God's elect today. Whether you're saved or not, my friend, does determine on what you believe today. Now, you tell me what you think of Jesus Christ. I can tell you whether you're saved or not. You tell me what you believe about his death on the cross and what it means to you, and his resurrection and what it means to you. And I think that I could tell you whether you're saved or not. Will you tell me what you think about the Bible, whether it's the Word of God or not? And I think that from that we could deduce whether you're a child of God or not. This is the norm, you see, according to the faith of God's elect. Now, the ones that are here that are the elect, he's not discussing the doctrine of election here at all. All he's saying here, these are the saved people, by the way. And this is the way he speaks of them. And the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. And the acknowledging here actually means knowledge of the truth, and the knowledge of the truth which is after godliness. My friend, if the truth that you have does not lead to a godly life, there's something radically wrong with your faith, by the way, something radically wrong with it. We hear today, and I heard this recently, of a man, a preacher, who I understand he drinks, that he cusses, belongs to the country club and runs at that crowd, and that he preaches the gospel and people come forward every Sunday. A preacher in that community was telling me that with great sorrow. And he said, Dr. McGee, how is it that man's prospering? Well, I don't think he's prospering. And I think he's bringing a lot of numbers into the church. But I honestly don't think that he's building the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, because it's quite obvious that the truth will lead to godliness. And if it doesn't lead to godliness, must not be truth, my friend. Something's radically wrong with that type of thinking, and there's a great deal of it abroad today. Now, the gospel, when it's believed, will lead to godliness. And we're going to find out Paul's going to dwell on this. In fact, In these pastoral epistles, Paul talks a great deal about godliness, and he certainly has a great deal to say against ungodliness. We're going to find out that when the grace of God saves us, over in the second chapter, verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness, we are to produce a life if we've been saved by grace. Now, the people on the island of Crete, 
They were abusing the grace of God. They said, since we're saved by grace, we are free to live in sin if we want to. And by the way, there are people today that take that position. Now, Paul answers this right here in the very first verse by saying that the truth of God that is believed, and when it is believed, the truth of God is really believed, it leads to godliness. Now, you'll find out Paul has a great deal to say about that. Now, these people there on the island of Crete, they were abusing the grace of God. And he says that grace saves us, and he's going to say, as we are going to see, that it lays down certain disciplines for our lives, and it calls us to live on a high plane. You cannot use the doctrine of the grace of God to excuse sin. It's impossible. If you think that you can be saved by grace and live in sin, I have to say this to you. You are not saved by grace, and you're not saved, period. Because if you've been saved by the grace of God, it leads to a godly life. Now, let's move on into verse 2 here, in hope of eternal life. The idea here is resting upon the hope of eternal life. And again, we're going to find out here we'll have grace in three time zones. And I guess I should say it at this time. We send out notes and outlines with no obligation upon you. We hope that if you're able to, that you will help us to continue on your station, because all we pay for is radio time. So we do offer books from time to time. And I do have a book on the little epistle of Titus called Grace in Three Time Zones. And it's in Titus 2, verse 11, "...for the grace of God that bringeth salvation." That's past. "...teaching us." That's present. And then future, looking for that blessed hope. And so that's what Paul is talking about here, in hope of eternal life, resting upon that hope, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began. Now, God cannot lie. Paul, you remember in the epistle to the Romans, made that abundantly clear. And I think sometimes we believers almost make God out a liar by the lives we live. We say, We believe something, we really don't believe that. And we act as if we don't believe it. And when we move like that, we're making God out a liar. Now, Paul says, you can be sure of one thing, that God cannot lie. I've often wanted to preach a sermon on things that God cannot do. Even God cannot do certain things. Here's one of them. God cannot lie. And did you know that? You see something every day that God has never seen? That's right. You've seen your equal. God's never seen his equal. Therefore, God cannot have an equal, and God cannot lie. Somebody says, well, why can't he lie? I can. (laughs) Well, you can do something God can't do. You see, God must be true to himself. He's holy. He's righteous. And that's his nature. And there's certain things he can't do because of his nature. It's not because of the fact that it would be an impossibility, but God is true to his nature. And his nature is that he's righteous and he's just and he never deceives. He's one that you can depend upon. Now, will you notice as he goes on here, he says, he promised before the world began and That has the idea that it moves back into eternity. It has the idea, really, in due seasons here, and we have that now in verse 3. But hath in due times, that is, in due seasons, due times, his own seasons. It's like God has the peach tree to bud in the spring, and he's made it so it won't stick out those beautiful buds when the first snow falls. He moves in a very orderly manner, by the way, in what he does, that he hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. And I'd like to change that because 
I think that there's a better word than that. The word for preaching here comes from the word kerux, which means trumpet. And a trumpet was used in that day to make a proclamation. If a ruler had a proclamation to make, a trumpeteer came out and blew a trumpet. And then the proclamation was made. And that's the thought that you have here. It's a proclamation. He hath in the correct seasons manifested his word through a proclamation. And Paul says, "...which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior." Now, he's writing to Titus, "...mine own son, my genuine son, after the common faith." And the word common here means it's that which is shared by all. It means this is the faith that all believers must have. That is, that a living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the common faith. Now he says to him here, "...grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior." Grace of God, as we're going to see, hath appeared. And God, therefore, extends mercy to us today. I don't know about you, but I use up a whole lot of the mercy of God. I'm glad he's good to me and does not deal with me according to my being very honorary, very disobedient. He's just been good. And mercy, grace and mercy and peace. And that peace is the present possession of the believer, but there's a peace coming when the Prince of Peace comes also from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, will you notice, we come down now to the second main division here. And the subject that I've given it is this, an orderly church must have ordained elders who meet the prescribed requirements. Now, that seems like a pretty long division here, but it's very important. Now, will you notice, verse 5, "...for this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city. Now, Paul had left Titus and Crete to organize local churches with elders as spiritual leaders. Now, let's look at this for just a moment here. Because, first of all, let's look at this island of Crete. It's one of the largest islands in the Mediterranean. And there was a great deal of mythology and tradition that was connected with this island, as there generally is with all of the Greek islands. Minos was the one who first gave laws to the Cretans. That is, that's according to their tradition. And he conquered the Aegean pirates that were there, and he established a navy. Now, after the Trojan War, the principal cities of the island, they formed themselves into several republics, mostly independent. And these chief cities were Canossus, Sidonia, and Gortina, and Lictus. In other words, apparently there were churches in all of these places. Paul had done a very effective missionary work on this island. We have no record of it whatsoever. Crete was annexed to the Roman Empire about 67 B.C. Now, we have no information, as we've said, beyond this epistle about his visit. And actually, there's no absolute proof that before his voyage to Rome that he ever went to that island. But we, I think, are led to believe that he was there and he had left Titus to organize the churches that were founded there by him and Titus. Now, we find that this city was a pretty bad place. I'd like to just call attention to certain things that are there, because these people were not very good people, I'd say. Paul is going to say something not very nice about them, that they are liars. And after all, that was the thing that they were noted for. There was a Greek word. And that means to speak like a Cretan, and that meant to be a liar. In fact, lying was called kretismos from the island of Crete. 
And one of their poets wrote this, by the way, Crete, which a hundred cities doth maintain, cannot deny this, though to lying given. Well, they were known as liars. <laughs> and that's what Paul's going to say now. And he'll say something else about them also. He didn't have very nice things to say about these Cretans. Now, many of them had turned to the Lord. And Paul tells Titus, you are to organize this church. Now, I believe that the gift of an elder is a gift of men to the church. I do not think by putting your hand on the head of some man and going through some little ritual makes him an elder. And yet, I believe that that is something that is important to be done to men who have the gift of elders. I think the churches in Crete had elders. But they'd never been ordained to set aside. It was men that had a gift of supervision of the churches. And these men were exercising the gift without really an authority. So what Paul is saying here is, set in order the things that are wanting and ordain here. He is to appoint. That's the meaning of it. That is, these men now are to be set aside as elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. In other words, I have appointed you, Titus, to appoint elders in these cities. Now, these men were men with certain gifts, you see, the gift of an elder. And I believe today that the great problem in many churches that there are certain men made officers who have no gift for that at all. That's half of our problem today in many churches, and the other half is that there are good men who have a gift, and they are not made officers in the church. And as a result, some of our churches get in the hands of the wrong folk, and it causes all kinds of problems. Now, you find that exists today. I could enlarge on this, as many of you know, and tell you some stories about some churches that make your hair stand on end. You talk about ghost stories. I don't have to tell ghost stories. I tell true stories. And they'd make your hair stand on it. But I don't want to make your hair stand on end. You may not have hair. And so I'd rather pass that by. Just take my word for it. Now, here is the requirement. He says here, verse 6, "...if any be blameless." Now, the thought here in this word, blameless is a man that it doesn't mean that he's perfect, but it means that any accusation made against him is not true. That's important. Not that he's perfect, but when an accusation is made against him, he's blameless. That's the whole point. If any be blameless, it's too bad when somebody can point a finger at an officer of the church and say, that man's dishonest. That doesn't help the cause of Christ I don't care how gifted the man might be with natural gifts. And if you can point to a man and say, that man's mouth is certainly not dedicated, his language is set. These are things, you see. He should not be guilty of these things. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife having faithful children. And the idea here, faithful children, means believing children. And if a man can't lead his own children to the Lord, he ought not to be an officer in a church. Now, don't misunderstand me. I recognize that today in many of our wonderful Christian homes, there is that son or that daughter that's away from the Lord, gives no evidence, and they're godly parents. Now, what Paul is saying is this. That man may be a wonderful man, and he may have had a wonderful Christian home, and he may not be guilty of anything that caused that boy or girl to turn from Christ, but he shouldn't be an officer in the church. Because when he sits as an officer in judgment on somebody else, you see, it's so easy to point a finger at the man and say, well, what about your son? What about your daughter? What right have you, you see? So it's for the cause of Christ, the sake of the office, that Paul's talking about here, you see. And he must have believing children, not accused of profligacy. 
are unruly. Our translation says of riot. In other words, they ought not to be out on a protest movement carrying a placard. If they're going to carry a placard, it shouldn't be a protest, but a placard glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I do think there's a better way of getting the word around than that. I can't understand why somebody can't see that giving the word out on radio might be a little bit better than carrying one of these placards around today. We're sometimes misunderstood by that. Now, let me move along, because you see how practical this is. He says, "...for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-will, not soon angry." That means not touchy. You know, a lot of us are touchy. And there are times, I guess, when all of us are a little touchy about something. But he's not to be touchy, not given to wine, not violent, not given to filthy lucre. That is, not covetous. And he says, now, bishop. Now, you see, as we said before in First Timothy, an elder and a bishop are the same office. You see, elder refers to the person. Bishop refers to the office. Because actually, presbyteros, the elder, it means a man, and I think a mature man, ought to be the office. And bishop here is episkopos, means overseer. That has to do with the office. Never was one man made a presbyter or a bishop in a church. Always several, you see. And this, I think, is the same office. I think we need to recognize that. Also, let me say that I do not believe that this man Titus went there and arbitrarily picked out men. I don't think he went there and just said, eeny, meeny, miny, mo." He didn't do it that way and picked this one and that one. I think these men were already elders, but now they are to be ordained. And now I recognize that some believe that this man Titus appointed them. But I believe that if he did that, then the church had to pass upon these men, and I'm sure that they did. I do not care to make an issue of that because I do not think it's that important for us today. But the important thing to note are the requirements for this particular office. And again, I must repeat, there never was just one. There always were the elders and the office of a bishop. And there were many of them, you see. Now, we're told here he's a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober-minded, just, and holy, and temperate. Now, these are the requirements of the man, and I'm sure that these are things that we're familiar with. And now Paul goes on to say, holding fast the faithful word. And I'd like maybe to change that just a little. Holding fast the trustworthy word according to the teaching that he may be able to exhort in the sound teaching and to convict the gainsayers. Now, there were two things, therefore, that this officer was to do. One was he should be able to exhort, that is, to teach the Word of God. That is, I think, very important for us to see. And he also must be able to refute the heretics, if you please. And that's exactly what I think gainsayers mean here. He is to be able to do two things now. The positive side is to teach the Word of God, and he's to be able to refute these heretics that are around about him. And personally, I think that men who hold an office in a church should be Bible-trained men. They just can't be made like, you remember a few years ago in World War II, we had what was called, wasn't it called 90-day lieutenants? A man was made an officer in some short course, and they needed him and put him through in a hurry. And, of course, they came up with some rather peculiar second lieutenants in those days. But very frankly, the same should apply in the church. You remember Paul said, lay hands suddenly on no man. You're not to have a man converted one night and then have him up giving his testimony the next night 
and making him an officer the third night, and making him then an evangelist on the fourth night, and the pastor of a church on the fifth night. We move like that today, and I think it's very unfortunate for the church. A man should be able now to stand on the Word of God and to give it out. Now he says, beginning here with verse 10, He's going to talk about the bad reputation of the Cretans. This is on the island of Crete. And believe me, friends, all men are sinners. Every tribe, condition of man, we all are brothers in the sense that we are all sinners. But we are not all in the brotherhood of God because you only become that through the new birth, becoming sons of God through faith in Christ. But we sure are all sons of Adam. And in Adam, all die because all have sinned. But these Cretans, they were a little worse than some others. Well, you notice this. For there are many unruly and vain talkers, that is, empty chatterers. There are certain Christians, I'm sure that you know, that they are rather frothy at the mouth. Great talkers. Just talk of Blue Street. I rode the other day with a man about 200 miles in his car. And from the moment I got in till I got out, the only thing I had to do was grunt. And he kept talking. I didn't mind that because I didn't want to talk. I was weary. I had preached, and I really wanted to rest. But it wasn't necessary for me to talk. And when you add up all he had to say, it was just a great big bag of nothing. That is a whole lot of hot air, and there are many empty talkers. Now, it's one thing to have fun. It's one thing to be lighthearted. But my friend, as a Christian, if you're living on a plane where it's nothing in the world, by just constant chatter and with nothing in the world but empty words, that's what this means. And deceivers, and what do they do, especially they of the circumcision, and there were many there that were tempting, of course, to contradict Paul. And verse 11 says, "...whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake." Now, they overthrow whole families, you see. This actually was a very serious sort of thing. And I don't care wherever the Word of God is sown, the devil always gets in. He's the enemy, and he always sows tares. Now, I found that to be true. I was back east not long ago, and somebody was telling me on a certain radio station, which is meeting a great need. We are reaching multitudes of people there, and many have turned to Christ. And they told us about one of the cults now follows our program. And, of course, the fellow attempts to correct us. He does it in a nice way. He dare not mention me by name because that probably would take him off the air. But the important thing is to note that the devil always gets in. Now, great work had been done in Crete, but the enemy was right there to sow seed. And he says they teach things ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Now he goes on. He says, one of themselves... Even a prophet of their own said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And my friend is, I wouldn't think Paul's being complimentary here, would you, when he speaks of them like that. But actually, they had that reputation in the Roman world of Paul's day. That island is, as we've said before, one of the largest of the Greek islands. It is the largest. And the one that Paul is referring to when he says that one of their own, one of their poets, it was Epimenides. And he was born in Crete in 659 B.C. And there's a legend that goes with him that strictly Greek mythology. He was sent out at his father's order in search of sheep, and he lay down in a cave, and he fell asleep, and he slept for 50 years. This was the first Rip Van Winkle. And he was not only the first Rip Van Winkle, 
because after sleeping 50 years, his hair grew. And when he appeared, he had long hair and a flowing beard. He was not only the first Rip Van Winkle, he was the first hippie that we have. And he had an astonishing knowledge of medicine and natural history. And the stories that concern him are tremendous. I don't care to develop that other than to call your attention that he's one of their outstanding ones, and he's the one that wrote Crete, which a hundred cities doth maintain, cannot deny this, though the lying given. And the very word Cretan was put into a Greek word, kratismos, which means lying. And it doesn't mean everybody lived in Crete were liars any more than when you can say that all of these Scottish people are tight-fisted, because some of them are very liberal. Carnegie, who gave all the libraries, he was from Scotland, and he was very generous. But that's the reputation that they have. Of course, somebody got out the word that the reason that the Scottish people have that reputation is that at heart, they're really very generous. And because they just have a tendency to give away everything, they had to circulate that report that they were rather tight-fisted so that they wouldn't lose everything they have. And that, my friend, I think is mythology also. But the Cretans had this reputation. Now, it's marvelous what the grace of God can do and did do among these people there. And so he calls them, they're liars, they're evil beasts, beastly, act like animals. And they're lazy gluttons. They were lazy people and big eaters, by the way. Paul goes on to say in verse 13, This testimony is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Paul says, you're going to have to be a little more strict with them than you are with others. Because, of he says, of their background of their very nature. And he says he was to rebuke them, that they'd be sound in the faith and not giving heed to Jewish fables. Now, I believe that that's more than legalism. You see, there grew up around the Mosaic law a great deal of writing. The Talmud is one. And there's some weird tales. And a lot of these Jewish writings, by the way, I've not read very much in that line, because, frankly, it's never interested me too much. But I have read some, and you can read some pretty wild tales there. Now, Paul says, don't give heed to these fables that are being told and commandments of men. You remember the Lord Jesus rebuked the religious rulers for adding tradition to God's law. And that, I think, is what now Paul is talking about here. And commandments of men that... Turn from the truth. You see, all this teaching today of legalism, and it's in two different phases. One is that you're saved by the law, and the other is that you're to live by the law. And both of those teachings, may I say to you, and say it kindly, is as dangerous as any teaching can be. We're saved by the grace of God, and we're called to a higher plane than just the Ten Commandments, Actually, God gave the Ten Commandments to a nation. And I think it should be the law of the world today. When God says, thou shall not kill, that is for whether you're Christian or not. That's for the whole world. And you shall not bear false witness. That's for the world. But we're saved by the grace of God and called to live on a much higher plane. Now, he says in verse 15, under the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Now, this is the verse that a great many of these folk that say very opposite, that we're saved by grace and it doesn't make any difference how we live, and that if we're saved and pure, we can live any way. And there have always been certain cults that have developed that. The leaders have said, well, we live in sin, but they don't call it sin. For us, it's not sin. We're permitted to do this because under the pure, all things are pure. 
Now, may I say to you that what Paul is talking about here hasn't anything to do, I think, with morals at all. He's talking about this matter of legalism and the eating of meats. You see that a great many people go off on diet, and generally a cult always comes up with a very unusual diet. And what we have here is under the pure, all things are pure. Paul says, whether you eat meat or whether you don't eat meat, it make no difference. What difference does it make? The thing of it is that all food is clean. <laughs> Under the pure, all things are pure. If you want to eat rattlesnake meat, that's your business. And it's my business, too, not to eat it if I can keep from it. But the point is, there's nothing wrong if you want to eat it. And that would apply to any kind of meat. Under the pure, all things are pure. But if you're unbelieving, what difference does it make what you eat? You can eat vegetables, and you can eat carrots till you grow ears like a jackrabbit. But my friend, if you're not converted and you're not right with God on the inside, well, nothing's going to be pure. The Lord Jesus made that clear again. It's not the thing that goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of the man. Now, Paul is developing that here. Now, verse 16, he says, "...they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him." And, you know, there are a great many believers today, very frankly, that can deny God and do deny God by the lives that they live. And they deny the Word of God. Now, it's one thing. I knew a man that he was an officer in the church. He carried the biggest Bible I think I've ever seen. When he put it under his arm, he came in leaning over on that side. I always thought someday he's going to trip and fall over on that side because he was rather top-heavy in that direction. He carried a great big Bible, and he was very pious. And everybody around him believed that he was pious. But I want to tell you, outside, he had a reputation. And there are great many folk didn't believe that the man was really honest. Now, you see, he may carry a big Bible, but he doesn't really believe it. You see, you can deny the Bible by the life that you live. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. And you can deny God by the life you live. Being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Now, that means that they're reprobate unto every good work. I would say this is a tremendous passage of Scripture. And by the way, it's very practical, is it not? It fits right down where we live today. You see, ceremonies and rituals cannot change the evil heart of man. Only the Word of God can change a human heart. And when the heart is changed, it's going to be revealed in the man's life. In other words, Paul is saying here, same thing James said, and Paul and James were never in disagreement. Faith without works, it's dead. <laughs> Saving faith, it produces something. And faith, as Calvin said, faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. Now, that brings us to chapter 2. And here, the church is to teach and preach the Word of God. And the church must teach sound doctrine or it's not a church. You see, the thing that identified the early church at the beginning, and we have a little book on that entitled The Spiritual Fingerprints of the Visible Church. And I go back to the day of Pentecost, and we are told that there were certain ones that were added to the church on that day. And what did they do? Well, they continued. We're told at that time they continued in the apostles' doctrine and they continued in fellowship and in prayers and in breaking of bread so that the early church, you see, continued in these things. And the thing that marked the early church is apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. Now, if a church doesn't have sound doctrine, I don't care how high the steeple is, and I do not care how beautiful the chimes are on top. 
and it's not the chimes on top. It is the message that's going out over that pulpit that's going to tell whether it's really a church, an organized church, as Paul understood it and as the Word of God declares it. Now, the first chapter had to do of setting things in order in the church. Church should be an orderly church. And now, in this chapter, the church is to teach and preach the Word of God. Because you understand that the elders that he was to ordain, they were to do, you remember, two things. They were to exhort, and then they were to refute or confute the heretics. Well, you can't spend all your ministry just refuting everybody, and yet there are many men that have what I would call a negative ministry. All they do is make an attack upon the enemies of the gospel, and that probably is needed. But I believe that we all need a balanced ministry, and I think Paul makes that clear here in this first chapter. He tells how the mouth of the heretic must be stopped, and an officer ought to know enough about the Word of God to answer him, as Peter put it, to be able to give a reason for the hope that's in you. Now, in chapter 2, the emphasis is put upon the teaching of the Word of God. Now, will you listen? Verse 1, chapter 2 of Titus, "...but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine." That's important. And sound doctrine, the thing we called attention to before, is the doctrine of the apostles. And the early church continued, number one, in the apostles' doctrine. That's the things that are taught to us in these epistles here. Now, it's very practical. We have here, first of all, he has a message for the senior citizens. First, the senior citizen who's male, then the senior citizen who's female. And here we have that the aged man be sober-minded grave, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. They're to be sound in their love and in patience. Now, this is something that we need to recognize. They are to be sober, that is, very vigilant, very serious, men that can be respected and self-controlled. These are the things that are mentioned here. And now for the aged women. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Now, they should be reverent in their behavior, not gossips or drunkards. And they are to teach the young women here. Verse 4 of chapter 2 of Titus, that they may teach the young women to be sober-minded, to love their husbands to love their children, and there are to be an example to them, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, there are several things here. Keepers at home mean there to be workers at home. Now, I'm going to get in trouble here, but I have to say this. A wife's first responsibility is in her home. And we need to recognize that the home's not a playpen. It's a pretty serious sort of a business to be a wife and to have children in the home. And it's not something that you're to take lightly. And therefore, there's an emphasis placed here. Now, I'm confident that Paul would never have approved of the women's lib movement. Now, again, here I go, sticking my neck out. But after all, they say fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I'm opposed to it. I think it's wrong. (laughs) I think a woman wants to be treated like a woman, not like a man. I was in a business the other day, a large business establishment, where I guess there were 50 stenographers there. And I had a notion from what I'd heard that they had really been promoting the women's lib there, demanding that they be promoted and all that sort of thing. I'm from being promoted according to their ability and all that. But I noticed when we came to the elevator to get on, believe me, they felt like they should get on first. 
And I felt like just jumping right ahead of them, but I didn't. I'd been taught otherwise, so I let them get on first. But I noticed they're willing to do that, but they are demanding equality every way. Now, if they're going to do that, then I don't think they don't just work in offices. There are a lot of ditch diggers that are needed today. And I'm for them doing that if that's what they want is equality. But I don't think they really want that. The primary business, the biggest business in the world is the home. And that is the thing that he's talking about here. Now, I'll get letters on this, but I don't mind. I love to read them, friends, good or bad. Now, will you notice, they are to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. And good means kindly, be kind, and obedient to their husbands. And I'm going to have to say a word about that. Actually, this word obedient here, and I have traced this down, by the way, pretty well. And I'd like for you to know that the idea here is being those that respond to their husband. Now, this is the same word that Paul used over in Romans, the 8th chapter. Over there, he speaks about obedience, and we've translated it obedience there. But I think we need to understand what it means. And it says, "...because the carnal mind is enmity against God." For it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, the thought there is this, that the natural man cannot respond to God. He can't obey God because he has no way of responding to God. Now, a wife is to respond to her husband. And that's the thought that is here. She's a responder. And man is the aggressor. No woman in my book should go to a husband and say, I love you, until he says, I love you. This big red-faced fellow that came in to see me, great big brawny fellow, he said, I want you to talk to my wife, and I want you to tell her to obey me. Well, I said, brother, I'm not going to tell her anything of the kind. He says, why? Well, I said, I'd like to ask you a question. I said, when's the last time that you told her that you loved her? Well, he says, I don't know. What's that got to do with it? I said, that has everything to do with it. I said, until you tell her that you love her, I don't see why she should respond to you. Didn't you tell her first that you loved her when you were courting? She says, of course I did. Well, I said, just keep that up, boy. I said, the thing to do, just keep up the courtship. You just keep telling her that you love her, and then she can tell you that she loves you. And I think that she'll respond to you a great deal better than she is. My, what a admission that poor boy made. Now, let me move down, because this is quite wonderful, as you can understand. Now, he says here, young man. Now, he's turning to the young man and young women. Young man, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Now, you see this young preacher, Titus, he was young. Now, Paul says, you be a pattern for the other young man in doctrine, showing uncorruptness. And I think that word, uncorruptness, is quite an interesting word here. It has in it the thought that they have no lack of faith. It's not faithlessness. And I just made a new word, by the way. And I'm sorry I did it. But that's the thought here. And in doctrine showing uncorruptness, no lack of faith, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. In other words, let your conversation reveal what kind of person that you are. Exhort servants. Now, he turns to another group, and in the early church, there were many slaves. In fact, in the catacombs, 90% of those names are the names of slaves or ex-slaves. That's where the gospel met a great need in those early days, you see. And he says, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. Again, respond to them. Be interested in their business and their work. Anyone, especially in Christian work, 
If he doesn't put his heart in it, he ought to get out of it. That's my idea. You don't work in Christian organizations to make a living. You work in Christian organizations because you want to work in it. And I hope you get a good living out of it. I don't mind that. That's not the point. The point is the Christian work is to be done with the heart as well as with the head and the hand. That's important. Now it says here, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not talking back to them, not purloining, that is, not stealing from them. I have statistics somewhere of how many millions of dollars that businesses lose today because employees steal from them. Not purloining. Don't be a thief but showing all good fidelity, that is, faithfulness, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Now, this word for adorn is the word we get our word cosmetics from. And now here's a question that comes every now and then. Do you think a woman ought to use makeup? Yes, this kind of makeup. Plenty of it, by the way. Adorn the doctrine of God. In other words... You say you're sound in the faith. Then put on the cosmetics. I'd like to see a little of the lipstick of a kind tongue. That's a mighty fine lipstick. And it's a new lipstick, by the way. Speak kindly. And then powder on the face. And that means sincerity and reality. My, there are all kinds of cosmetics that you can use today as a Christian. And I sure do like to see Christians using a whole lot of these cosmetics that Paul's talking about here. Now, Paul stops in order to put a foundation in under the lives of these people. And he now states the gospel. And the gospel is in three time zones, the past, the present, and the future. I know that many times I fly to Dallas, Texas, and then back here. And I still, though, have a horse and buggy mental chassis. And I never cease today to wonder at the speed of travel today by jet. I get on the plane there at Love Field in Dallas. I did on a cold, blustery day. A norther was coming in. The mercury was hovering at zero. And in a little more than an hour... I dropped right down into the salubrious climate of Southern California, as well as the smog. But you say, well, how would you do that in an hour? Well, it was because there are three time zones. That was Central Standard Time. That was Mountain Standard Time. That was Pacific Standard Time. And therefore, it really took, at that time, almost four hours, but at least three hours. And they're going to get this thing down. I understand this plane that they're beginning now to fly. It goes three times the speed of sound. And that means that you can leave Dallas, Texas, and you'll arrive in Los Angeles two hours before you leave Dallas. Now, that's going to be something. You catch up with yourself there. But as wonderful as it is, I think the most wonderful thing in the world is the grace of God. And it's in three time zones. It's in the first time zone that's here. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That's past. And then we're told here, teaching us that denying ungodliness, worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That's the present time zone of grace. And then you have the third time zone. That's a future looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. These are the three time zones of grace. And we have here grace and three time zones. Now, will you notice that? We have here for the grace of God. Paul says, now just a minute. He says, I want to put down under you Cretans because you need a foundation. I want to put down under you the doctrine of the grace of God. Now, the grace of God here is the way God saves us. And the gospel is not good advice. Years ago, a great preacher in Shreveport, Louisiana, Dr. Dodd, I heard him say, the pulpit, my pulpit is the place for good news. My study 
is the place for good advice. The gospel's not good advice. It's good news. And it's more than good news. It's the power of God unto salvation. Now, Paul is enjoining Titus to demand of the Cretans that they live lives that adorn the gospel, for it's the power of God, you see. And there's absolutely no excuse for any Christian to live a life of defeat and failure. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. The word here is, it shined forth. It's the epiphany. It's when he came 1,900 years ago. And the gospel is what he did for us. He died for us. And God, therefore, doesn't save us by love. And he doesn't save us by mercy. By grace are ye saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Now, mercy is the compassion of God that prompted him to send a Savior to man. And God loved man. But you see, God didn't save by love. If one man could be saved by the mercy of God, all mankind would be. It wouldn't be necessary for Christ to die. You could circumvent the cross. But you see, love is the divine motive. But God's not only love. He's righteous, holy, just. And the holy demands of God had to be met. His just claims, his righteous standards must be met. And love may long to save, but the immutable law of justice makes love powerless to do so. And so Christ, by dying for your sins, he met the holy demands of justice. And God can now save you by grace. How wonderful it is. We can be saved by the grace of God. When we were guilty, Christ paid the penalty. And grace is not complicated or implicated with human effort. God doesn't ask your cooperation to save you. He doesn't ask for your conduct or your character. God only asks men to believe him, to trust him, to accept Christ, to take his way. And God's way is the best way, and it's the only way. And then you have the grace of God teaching us that denying and God's not trying to reform this world. He's redeeming men who will accept Christ. And the gospel doesn't appeal to Christ's rejected men to do better. I'm going to try and do better. When you say that, I think you're a liar. I didn't say that. John said that. And now if you've rejected Jesus Christ, try and get all you can out of this life because that's all you're going to get. The government is asking people today to give up cigarettes. They want to educate you. God's not asking you to do these things. God says, eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you'll die. You can smoke your cigarettes for tomorrow. You're going to die of cancer, and they'll put you in a flip-top box. May I say to you, God is calling those who are his own, who are redeemed, to live for him. Teaching, that means child training, educating them to avoid worldly lusts. And then this wonderful thing we've talked about so much before, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the blessed hope. And that is the next happening in the program of God is his coming to take his church out of this world. And this reveals that Paul taught the deity of Christ, and I believe it means here of the great God. And he's also our Savior. And who is he? He's Jesus Christ, my friend. What did he do? He gave himself for us, that he might redeem us, paid a price for us, that he might redeem us not just out of sin, that's true, but redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a people of his own zealous of good works. Sure, God wants you to live for him. And sure, God wants good works, but he'll have to redeem you first, friends. Now, Paul says, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee, your young man. Don't let him despise you because of the life you live. Friends, this is quite wonderful, is it not? Every young preacher ought to study Titus. Now, friends, we've come to the third and the last chapter of the epistle to Titus. The subject of this chapter is the church is to perform good works. Now, as we said, the three chapters 
divide, I think, very nicely. The church, first of all, it's an organization, and it's to be orderly. And then the church, as we saw, is to be sound in doctrine. And the church is to perform good works, as we're going to see in this chapter here. Now, to be a church that is full-orbed and covers all the spectrum that God wants for the church, the church is to perform good works. Now, in chapter 3 here, I begin reading at verse 1. "...put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work." Now, the very first thing that he mentions here is the fact that the church must have members who are law-abiding. I always felt embarrassed when I had to get up on Thursday night in downtown Los Angeles and announce that somebody had parked in a no-parking place or that they had shut out some working man that wanted to go home to his family and they had parked in a way that he couldn't get out. And actually, that was really breaking the law, to tell the truth, on the part of someone that apparently didn't pay very much attention to the fact that a Christian should be subject to principalities and powers. I think a believer should obey the laws of the land in which he lives if they do not conflict or contradict his duty and his relationship to God as he sees it. Now, that brings up something I think very interesting, because this is a question that's not pertinent right now, but it has been and it could be again. And that is, should a young man that is drafted into the service, the military, should he go out when his religious convictions told him otherwise? Now, may I say to you, I think a fine group of young men were put in very bad light in this war in Korea because we had so many that ran away. And very frankly, I think they ran away not because of religious convictions, but I can't think of any other explanation other than they were disloyal to their country. They were not obedient to this nation. Yet these young men wanted to enjoy all the blessings and benefits of our nation, but did not want to meet its responsibilities. Personally, I'd be hard-boiled with them, and I think that's the way it should be handled. But that's not really the question here. The question is, what about that young man with real Christian convictions about this, been brought up that way? Well, may I say to you, he's been put in bad light today, but there were some that would not go into the armed forces to carry a gun, but they performed other duties. And I think they should be commended for that because I believe it takes a bit of courage and conviction for a young man under those circumstances to stand on his two feet and say, yes, I'll serve, I'll wear the uniform, but I cannot conscientiously carry a gun. And I think that there should be sympathy and understanding granted to that young man. We are, though, to be subject to the principalities and powers and a church should teach that, by the way. This is part of the message that should be given to church members. They should be obedient to the powers that be. And we're not obedient to the man, but to the office that he represents. I recognize that there are some policemen that are rather offensive. However, they've eliminated so much of that. And I think it's the police that is kind and it's the criminal who is brutal and cruel today. The thing's been reversed in our day. But we should respect that uniform. I can remember the day when you'd be stopped by a traffic officer and he'd bawl you out. And I'd just sit there and cringe as a young fella. I think I deserved it, but they don't do that today. But the fact of the matter is, it's the office that he occupies, and that is what we should respect because he represents that segment of 
our society that protects my home and your home. And I tell you, my friend, without them, we'd be in a bad way today. And this also raises the question whether Christians should go into politics or not. I believe that the individual Christian should go into politics, but I don't believe the church should go into politics. And if we had a real movement of the Spirit of God out of the church, would go men into these different offices in government during the Wesley Revival. And Wesley never tried to straighten out the king of England or even the church of England. He just... They put him out, and he began to preach the Word of God. And men were converted, and out of those great meetings came a man like William Wilberforce. And a man who was a gambler and a drunkard, no concern for the poor. And how do you suppose that the labor movement actually got started? Got started in that Wesley movement. That was the beginning against child labor, the movement against it. That was the beginning of the movement to protect workmen at the job. May I say to you that we do need individuals, but the church should stay out of it, never call to enter as an organization, but put them in mind. Speak to the individuals. Now, he says also to be ready for every good work. And here in this chapter, the church is told individuals to be eager to be anxious, and to learn to perform good works. Now, we'll note that as we go along. And he says here, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Now, the church should not only be ready, but actually there should be a preparation and eagerness. And there's the negative side. We're to speak evil of no man. That means, as I understand it, that we are not to repeat gossip. Somebody said that you can't believe everything you hear today, but you can repeat it. And that's the thing I think he's talking about. Do you have proof for what you're saying about someone else? And then another thing has been said, that some people will believe anything if it's whispered to them. We should be very careful today to speak evil of no man. That is, unless we have proof, unless we know what we're talking about. And then I think he should be marked out. Remember, Paul marked them out when he knew what he was talking about. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He didn't mind saying that. Now, will you notice? He says here, for we ourselves also were once foolish, And this is a picture of the unsaved. It was a picture of our condition once. Foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living selfishly for self, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. My friend, that's the picture of the lost world today. You go into any neighborhood today, actually go into any unsaved home today, Go into any business today. Go into any office today, any factory today. These are the things that you see there. And unfortunately, you see some of this in some of our churches. You see this envying and hating. And yet they talk about so many places about loving one another. And I want to tell you they're gossiping just as hard and fast as they can, broken up in little cliques and little groups and then talking about how sound they are in the faith. I tell you, they're a disgrace to the cause of Christ. This is the picture of the unsaved, and it ought not to be a picture of your church and mine. Verse 4, But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, now listen to this, not by works of righteousness which we have done. Now, this was a picture of us before. But to become a Christian doesn't mean to turn over a new leaf because you find out you write on that leaf just like you did on the old leaf. The idea of making new resolutions, promising to do better. It's too bad that your life was like it was before. But it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but it's according to his mercy. You see, 
Because Christ died for us and paid the penalty for our sins, God now is prepared to extend mercy to us. And it's according to his mercy he saved us. And he's rich in mercy. He has plenty of it. I don't care who you are. He can save you today because Christ died for you. The penalty has been paid. And he makes over to you his righteousness. And you stand complete in him. Then he says, by the washing of regeneration. Now, this word washing here is the laver of regeneration. The picture of the laver back in the tabernacle and then in the temple. And I believe what you have here is the same thing the Lord Jesus said in the third chapter of John. Born of water, you see, and of the Spirit. And the water represents the Word of God. Washing of regeneration. This Bible will wash you, you see. It has sanctifying power, cleansing power, cleansed by the Word of God. Washing the labor of regeneration so that what happens is the Spirit of God uses the Word of God. Born of water and of the Spirit. Lave of regeneration. And that's the way you're born again. And renewing of the Holy Spirit. And he regenerates you. That's the picture here. Which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And have you ever noticed that God always has a surplus of everything? Anything God does, there's surplus. When somebody says to me, You know, we prayed for so much money and the exact amount came in and we know God did it. Believe me, I think if God was in it, he'd have given you a few more dollars. He generally does. That's the way he moves abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. When you read through the Bible, notice how many times God has a surplus. Abundantly, you know. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. He doesn't just give you the exact amount, friends. He always has a surplus. Verse 7, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now again, he points to the hope of the believer, the coming of Christ for his church. Now verse 8, listen to him again. We're back talking about good works. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they who have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto man. Now, you see, the very fact that the believer saved by the grace of God, you see, doesn't excuse him from performing good works. The fact of the matter is, he is to perform them. And Paul says, you just keep affirming this constantly. After you've been saved, God's going to talk to you about good works. Up to that time, he's not even talking to you. If you are listening to this program and you have not accepted Christ, God's not even interested in your good works. Because what you call good works, God calls dirty laundry. The righteousness of man is filthy rags in his sight. He doesn't want it, friends. But he wants to save you. And if you come just like you are to him, he'll save you. Because he's done something for you, and he's not asking you to do something. What can you do for God? Now that you've been saved and you're his child, you know, he just wants to talk to you about good works. He wants you to produce something. He wants you to get involved, I think, to get the Word of God out today. That's the reason I keep mentioning that, friends. I feel like that you ought to be involved in getting the Word of God out. And you might be careful to perform good work. That is, these are things you should think about and consider and ponder and to be anxious about. Now, verse 9, "...but avoid foolish questions, genealogies, and contentions." and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable in vain. Now, Paul said we're to defend the faith, but not in argument or debate. That's no good. That never led anyone to the Lord. You might whip a man down intellectually, but you've not touched his heart and won him for Christ. 
Stay away from these foolish questions, genealogies today. That's the reason on this program I do not develop certain things that are sensational. Right through this period, there's been a great deal said about demonism. And I've had any number of letters. Oh, Dr. McGee, give a series on demonism. Write a book on it. No, let's not get involved in that today. I'd much rather tell you about the Holy Spirit that can indwell you. And if he does, no demon could ever possess you, my friend. Greater is he that's in you than the one that's in the world. And that's all we need on that today. It's so easy to go off, especially when you're not Bible taught. Verse 10, a man that's a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he, verse 11, that is such as subverteth and sinneth being condemned of himself. Now Paul is personal here at the end. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, Articus, be diligent to come unto me at Nicopolis. And I do not know where Nicopolis is, because there are three of them. But Paul says, For I have determined there to win her. Bring Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting. And let ours also learn to maintain good works. You've got to work at this, friends. A great many people think it's easy. You've got to learn to know what good works are and how to do them for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. All that are with me, greet thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Isn't that lovely? And may grace be with all of you today. And greet all that love us also. Tell them about the program.